You know, I always tell it to you. I wish and I pray that Christians should understand, could understand, would understand the importance of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian. You know, before Jesus went back to heaven, he told his disciple, told the disciples, what will be more useful for you is that I go. Because if I don't go, the Holy Spirit, the helper, will not come. But when I go, I will send him to you. And I've always meditated and said, why did Jesus say that it was more important, more useful for us that he goes? It's very simple to understand. Because if Jesus was around at this moment, he will be moving around, making miracles, preaching, helping people. But he will be alone. He will be the only one to be able to do it. But when he sent his spirit, the spirit of the Lord is everywhere. Which means that we have more people, more, a greater army that can do the things Jesus was doing around the earth. But unfortunately, because the Holy Spirit has been forgotten, in most churches, it's as if the absence of the Holy Spirit doesn't make a huge difference. You remember the story I often tell you about this Sunday school teacher? The kids were reciting the Apostles' Creed. And one kid came around and said, I believe in the Father, creator of the whole universe. Then the second one came, I believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Then the third one, who believes in the Holy Spirit, who was supposed to say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the giver of life. That day was sick. And then the Sunday school teacher said, the child who believes in the Holy Spirit is not here today, so see you next Sunday. I think sometimes that's what we have. We have people who believe in the Father. By the way, even that one, people don't know what to do with him. Others believe in Jesus Christ because they know what Jesus did for them. But they don't know what to do with the Holy Spirit. They just wonder, what do I do with that Holy Spirit? But look at the difference it made with the apostles when the Holy Spirit came. Actually, last Sunday, we are reading chapter 2 of the book of Acts. And Peter and the other disciples were hiding in an upper room, locked up because of fear of the Jews. Then the Holy Spirit came and went on each one of them in the form of fire. The following minute, they were on the street speaking loudly, speaking courageously, speaking convincingly, and 3,000 people were added to their numbers. Hallelujah. And we saw the story of Elijah and Elisha. Elijah, when he was going to go into heaven in a whirlwind, Elisha made a prayer and he said, a double portion of the spirit that's on you, that's the only thing I ask for. And Elijah told him, what you are asking for is not so easy, but you will get it if you see me going up to heaven and you remember he went in a whirlwind. And if you are going to keep your eyes open in a whirlwind, you are really determined. Because usually when you see a whirlwind coming your way, the first thing you do, you close your eyes so that you don't get a lot of dust in your eyes. But Elijah told Elisha, keep your eyes open. 
if you are really hungry and thirsty for the Holy Spirit, so when you see me going, you will get what you prayed for. I can imagine Elisha standing there and he saw the whirlwind coming his way. And he knew Elijah was going with that whirlwind. And he said, I'm going to keep my eyes open. Even if I become blind, I will open my eyes by the power. Hallelujah. And finally, when Elijah went up, his tunic, his cloak fell. So Elisha picked it up. And then he went to the river Jordan. And he said, let me see if the power is with me. He struck the water and the river divided in two and said, the power is here. The following things you understand. Actually, when you look at the life of Elisha, it became a powerful and very useful life. So go back to chapter 2 of the book of Kings and chapter 3 of the book of Acts. The readings we had today. And that's where we are getting our sermon. And the title is, When the Holy Spirit has come. When the Holy Spirit is present, has come, you will know. And you know, maybe the reason why people don't really crave or hunger or thirst for the presence of the Holy Spirit it's because they don't know the difference it makes when he has come. Amen. You know, when I was young, it always reminds me, when I speak about the Holy Spirit, Jesus told his disciples, I will not leave you as orphans. I will send the helper. And uh, when I was young, my dad was killed when I was five. And our dad was a businessman. And by then, a businessman, it wasn't just a matter of saying, well, he has money. Or, uh, it, they didn't have a car. He had a bicycle. So he used to take his bicycle and go all the way to Uganda and come back with goods. But one thing we liked when our dad came back, he always came back with sweets. You know those way, uh, actually, I don't think there's anybody who knows. There was this Madivani sweets uh, with Zifitimi, uh, Bomboza Madivani. Has anybody known those uh, sweets? Madivani sweets. Uh, has anybody eaten the Madivani sweets? Yeah, I, I see some, some people, no. So all of the time when my dad came, we lived somewhere. Actually, there was a small hill like this coming down to our place. So every time when dad came, we knew the first thing we did was to rush to him and we would tuck our hands in his pockets and get sweets. Much of sweets. So, all the time. Uh, then when I was five, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of that. It's a very sad story. My dad went... And we thought he had gone for business as usual. But actually, they were caught by night and then uh, murdered someone. It was the 1963 um, murders. So I always yearned for his return. I always say, told myself, when my dad comes back, sweets will come. But there were other things that we lacked because of his absence. We became orphans. And all the time I was saying, if my dad was here, I wish my dad was here. And that's what Jesus was telling his disciples. If I go and I don't send you the helper, you will feel like orphans. And I think sometimes we don't get that. The church at times looks like an orphan. No power, no sweetness, no strength. And I, and I can feel it. When Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. 
I will send you somebody to replace me. I will send you somebody with the provisions. I will send you somebody with the power. I will send you somebody with the guidance and the wisdom. And you will not feel like orphans. It's the Holy Spirit who makes a difference when he comes. Because Jesus saved us. But it's the Holy Spirit who comes with the provisions. And it's the Holy Spirit who comes with the sweets. Hallelujah. You know what I call the sweets or the Holy Spirit? The fruit. It's the Holy Spirit who brings the fruit. And it's the Holy Spirit who brings the power, the guidance, the wisdom. I can tell you, as I told you, it's a very sad story. Uh, by then, my mom was only 25. And uh, she was at a loss with four kids to look after in a very hostile environment. My dad's shop had been destroyed and looted. And you could tell she was confused. She lacked the power. She lacked the guidance. The good thing was, after one or two years, she picked up the pieces and it turned into another person. She probably understood that it's her responsibility to bring the guidance and the power in the family. And that's what the disciples did. When the Holy Spirit came, they were at a loss. They didn't know what to do. So finally, when the Holy Spirit came, they got the power. They got the wisdom. And they got the fruit. Hallelujah. Because the helper was back. Say amen. And that's what we need to understand. Sometimes I see how powerless the church is. Sometimes I see how confused Christians are. And I tell myself, I know that story. They live like orphans. They lack the power. They lack the provision. They lack the sweets. Because they live like orphans. But Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will send you the helper who will give you the power. Hallelujah. And look at this. On the first day after Pentecost, Peter and John are going to church as usual. This is the same Peter. This is the same John who were in the upper room trembling a few days before. So they go and they find this crippled man. Let's start with the crippled man. Actually, I like this picture. There is this crippled man and he's begging. And they tell us he was always brought I think members of the family said, okay, the only place where people go with some level of compassion is the temple. Not to the market, the temple. Because they had those mosaic laws that say you help the poor, when you give to the poor, you are lending to God and things like those. So they always took this man crippled to the beautiful gate. Can you see the contrast? A crippled man sitting at the beautiful gate begging. Can you see the powerlessness? Can you see the hopelessness? A man sitting at the gate of the temple. The beautiful gate. Not any other gate. I'm sure, probably, they put him at the beautiful gate because they knew that's where most people love to pass. So you, you stand a greater chance to get more money if you sit begging at the beautiful gate. And sometimes I have the same impression that's how many people look in a church. They are not crippled physically. 
but their wings, spiritual wings, have been clipped by the devil, and they are spiritually crippled. And they sit in the church, and they sing in the choir, and they put on robes like the pastor. They even get to a level where they are called canons, archdeacons. I will not go beyond, but they are crippled. No power. No power. They sit at the beautiful gate, crippled. They sing nice songs about a Holy Spirit who is not there. They tell you how wonderful it will be when the Holy Spirit is there. But you don't see the fire. You don't see the power. And you don't see the sweets. You don't see the fruit. Am I right? Sitting at the beautiful gate in the church, crippled. And you go out not only spiritually crippled, you are relationally crippled. You know, one of the big problems we have in life, in the church, in the families, in the workplaces, are crippled people who are emotionally and relationally crippled. Look at the number of divorces we are getting these days. In this country, we used to brag that divorce is very low. But the statistics are telling us that it's going high. If you read the statistics of the Supreme Court, 2016, they judged 21 cases of divorce. 2017, they judged 69 cases. 2018, they judged 1,331. I hope this year they are not going to tell us of 5,000. Because we live with people who are relationally crippled, important. Why? Because they lack the sweets. They lack the fruit of the Spirit. They don't have love. They don't have peace. They don't have joy. They don't have patience. They don't have kindness. They don't have gentleness. They don't have meekness. They don't have self-control. They don't have righteousness. Those are the sweets that come in the deep pockets of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. And those who don't have them, they are relationally crippled. Do we have them? I can swear, even among us sitting here, some people are simply emotionally and relationally crippled. Sitting at the beautiful gate in the church as orphans because they don't know the Holy Spirit has come. Don't say amen. That's not how it should be. And we have people who are logically confused. They are confused. You, you look around and you say, why is somebody doing such a thing? But he's simply confused. He's mentally not debilitated, but crippled. You know, sometimes when you see how people do things, you just wonder, do they know what they are doing? But when Jesus was speaking, he said, when the Holy Spirit comes, you will be empowered. Not only empowered spiritually, will be empowered physically, will be empowered mentally, will be empowered intellectually, will be empowered emotionally, will be empowered socially, will be empowered in everything. We receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. And that's what Peter did. He went by the beautiful gate with John and the others. And there was this man sitting there. That's my second point. The man was begging. A few coins, sir. A few coins for food, sir. A few coins, sir. Can't you see I'm crippled? A few coins, sir. 
And then something happened inside Peter. He looked at the man and he said, you've been receiving handouts for so many years. But it hasn't helped you. You know, and that's what we do in church. We give handouts. We give a few coins. Somebody is sick. We give handouts. We just go there and say, brother, be courageous. The Lord is watching. We don't even dare pray for healing because we don't trust we have the power. These days, praying for the sick is like committing a sin. We are scared of it. Even when you try to, they tell you, really? But we are Anglicans. What are those things you are bringing about? If somebody speaks in tongues, in the church, people say, what are those strange things happening? <laughs> you know, I was, I laughed. The other week when we were going into the week of Pentecost, on Monday, I preached here. And I often tell you, if you see a PhD holder speaking in tongues, then it's another miracle. And uh, sometimes I control myself so that the strange tongues don't go out. So that day I said, today I'm not going to control myself. Because usually, when, you know, when you are praying and you feel something happening, you just put the microphone aside, then you control yourself, and then you keep speaking in Kinyarwanda. That day I let it go. And then somebody, when we were going, said, Pastor, uh, did you know that you spoke in tongues when you were praying? I said, I know. I did it voluntarily on will. But that's not the story. A young lady was sitting down there. She fell on the ground. She, she went praying. She went on praying. Then people took her out. Said, what are you doing? Do you have a demon? Why? Because it doesn't sound very Anglican to be filled with the Spirit. The talk of that night wasn't the sermon I gave. It was hearing the pastor speaking in tongues on the microphone. Because it doesn't sound very Anglican. We are very controlled people. Am I right? Anyway, the day you hear Engineer Elias speaking in tongues, then you know that the fire has come. <laughs> because you see, PhD holders, masters holders, they learn to be self-controlled. You don't allow the Holy Spirit to just cause any confusion. You control everything. So Peter goes to that place. Then he looks at the man. It was the first time Peter was going to make a miracle. He looked at the man and the Holy Spirit said, so, uh, Peter looked at the man. He put his hand in his pocket and there was no money. And then uh, the Holy Spirit told him, actually, you have something bigger than the money. Because when you give money to the beggar, you are simply giving a temporary solution. You are tackling the symptom. Now I want you to tackle the cause. And then he stretched his hand and told the man, look at me. And leave him alone. And he picked the hand of the man and said, in the name of Jesus, stand up. Hallelujah. All of a sudden, the man stood up and said, I can walk, I can jump, I can praise God. Because when Jesus comes, he doesn't give us handouts, temporary solutions. He gives us a permanent solution. You know, when you struggle with things, you keep struggling with them until Jesus comes and says, I'm going to give you power over your life. I'm going to give you self-control over your life. I'm going to give you the sweets of the Holy Spirit. And rather than live in the power of the flesh, you are going to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And that's what we need to understand because that's what happens when the Holy Spirit comes. We are no longer living in the handout mentality. 
get me somebody to pray for me. Get somebody to help me with this. Get, you get the power for everything. And you know, what sometimes we don't know, Jesus gives the power that touches every area of our life. The physical, the mental, the emotional, the spiritual. The four levels of our life. We are empowered in the four levels. I, I love always stressing this one before I finish. Because we think the Holy Spirit is confined to the church. No. Actually, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit wasn't so much about church. There was no such a thing as church. The Holy Spirit was about life. When Elisha got the power, go back to that passage. People went to him and they told him, Elisha, this city is in a, is in a nice place. But the water is bad and the land consequently is unproductive. What did Elisha do? He didn't heal the symptoms. He took salt. Which sometimes is a symbol of the Holy Spirit or a symbol of the church. And he went to the source. He went to the source and he put water into, put salt into the water. And he said, from this day on, the water is going to be clean and the land is going to be productive. Hallelujah. And I'm sure the miracle wasn't about the church. The miracle was about city life. Amen. When Joseph was in Egypt, Pharaoh had a dream. And the dream was about the future of the land. And Joseph, under the power of the Holy Spirit, because even Pharaoh himself said, where will we find a man with the Spirit of God in him? So they put him in charge of the planning and the economy of Egypt. And the whole land was saved from starvation. Do we get people today who say, we need somebody to organize this. Where shall we find somebody with the Spirit of God in him? Probably not. Why? Because we have convinced everybody, and we too we are convinced, the Holy Spirit is for music in church, speaking in tongues. It has nothing to do with organizing. It has nothing to do with the discoveries. But let me tell you something. Paul, when he was writing to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said, we have the mind of Christ. We have the creative mind of Christ. We have the innovative mind of Christ because of his spirit that lives in us. Christians should be the most innovative people. They should be the most transformative people. They should be the most inspiring people. But what are we? Just crippled. The only thing we know is how to make noise inside the church. But we, when we get out, we are just like everybody else. We lie like everybody else. We cheat like everybody else. We commit adulteries like everybody else. We divorce like everybody else. Doesn't make a difference. Because we are beggars sitting at the beautiful gate. We don't know the Holy Spirit has come. And today I want to challenge you. Look at Peter. The man stood up and the name of Jesus was lifted. Not because Peter preached, but because the man was helped to walk. Mayor, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to your pastors. You know, we get churches all over the country. And then they tell us, you know, I went to Gatsibo. Um, and they were presenting the Imihigo performance contract. And you know the area where they are not at 100%, that's the area where the church should be useful. Uh, social life. I think they were up to 77. But imagine you sitting here. And we have members of the church who don't have Mitwer do Sante, who can't. And then we jump and say, we have the spirit in us. We are totally useful, useful inside the church and useless out. 
And that's how life is. We have many successful people, successful businessmen, successful politicians, but hopeless at home. Big churches, useless in the community. Why? Because we are crippled. The power of the Spirit is not in us. The day Peter was filled with the Spirit, a crippled man knew the power was there. And people praised God because something had happened in the community. Not because they were inside the building. We often brag about our buildings. We are now becoming so proud of our new building. But that's not it. You don't need a lot of power to build a church like that. You simply need money. But to fill that church and transform the community around, we will need power, like Peter did. We can sit in church and fill it with people who are relationally crippled. Their homes are breaking down. Their relationship at work are bad, crippled. Sitting in a beautiful church, the beautiful gate, crippled. So will we today start craving for change, start craving for power, start craving for the sweets of the Holy Spirit? Because it's only when the Holy Spirit is here that people will feel a difference. That people will know something has happened in Remera. In your own life. In your home. In your workplace. And the nation will know that the Holy Spirit is here. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we reckon that we haven't been what we are supposed to be. We have moved without power. We have moved without the spirit. We have moved like orphans, fending for ourselves, using our own solutions, using our own strength, while you've sent the helper. Today, Lord, we are praying that you open our minds that we open our eyes to see how helpless, how hopeless we are without the Holy Spirit. And let the power of your Holy Spirit flow. Flow in us to give the provision of power, to give the provision of wisdom, to give the provision of innovation, to give the provision of transformation that we need to create an impact in the lives of people. So help us. Visit us. Let your anointing come for Lord, many of us don't know what they will do with the Holy Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he will tell us, send your Holy Spirit amongst us. You've sent him, we know. But open our hearts to understand and open our minds to crave for his presence, to hunger for his power, to thirst for his fruit. And the Holy Spirit, come and help us. By ourselves, We've been inoculated. For long we have lived at the beautiful gate, powerless, crippled, and we are used to it, and you've taken it as normal. This day we are praying that things change, that people discover they need you, that I too, as a pastor, as a leader of this church, I discover to which level, to which heights you can take us. And help us to take your people to that level. Not only this church, but all the churches around. Give us to impact this community because the Holy Spirit has come. Give us to impact this nation because the Holy Spirit has come. Give us to impact our homes with the fruit of the Spirit. Let your love, let your peace, let your joy, let your meekness and your kindness and your gentleness and your patience be abundant in our relationships. Be abundant in our homes. Be abundant in our workplaces. Let your Holy Spirit flow and command everything. And let your power be manifested. And let your presence be seen by everybody. Lord, bless us. Give us more, more of you. 
more of your love, more of your power, more of your peace, more of your joy, more of you, O oh Lord, in our lives. And let your name be glorified. Let your name be praised. And let your people rejoice. For in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.